Ted Weschler is one of Berkshire Hathaway's top two investment managers. You got started at W.R. Grace and Company as a junior financial analyst and then helped start the private equity firm Quad C Management, where you were a partner for 10 years. Then in 1999, he went out on his own, founding Peninsula Capital Advisors, which was a hedge fund you launched in 2000, above a bookstore yep. in a Charlottesville mall. And before that shuttered in 2011, you joined um, Berkshire Hathaway, and the $2 billion fund has returned 1,236% for investors. Ted and his wife, Sheila, live in Charlottesville with your two daughters. How, right. how old are your daughters? Uh, 20, well, one will turn 21 in just uh, oh, a few weeks, and the other is 23. Okay, yeah. close, close to mine, so yeah. I, know, I know that life, except I have boys. So. <laughs> <laughs> they should meet. <laughs> well, super excited to have yeah. you um, talk to us, but this particular time of year is, you know, going into the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, actually being live and not mm -hmm. virtual. It's been a couple of years. For us, it's just a super exciting time and, and yeah. high energy and yeah. for the, 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 you know, tens of thousands of people that come through, but what's it like? What's it like for you being on the, the inside of Berkshire Hathaway? And it's, yeah, it's, it's, exciting. It, it's terrific because it's something that I think we all draw energy from. And it, uh, you know, the closer we get, the more energy we get. And the last two years, they were fine. You know, it was we did the remote thing. But there's something about bringing, you know, tens of thousands of people together. And I, I kind of describe it as a, a big wedding, you know, because you've got this common link of one way or another you're connected to Berkshire Hathaway. Mm -hmm. and so anybody that you meet during that weekend that's, you know, wearing the credentials, whether it's up here at the you're Mart or anywhere in town, you got something to talk about. You know, it's just like at a wedding where you, you know that you're somehow connected to the bride or groom, you're somehow connected to Berkshire. And so it's always fun to meet those people. And then just the energy that builds at the office. I mean, I'm always amazed at the amount of uh, paper and phone calls and emails and all the rest <laughs> that we've got a very small snap, but it just, it flies out of there in a really, really efficient way. And uh, and it's fun. And Warren gets progressively uh, excited as well, you know, because he, he really... He both adds energy to it and he draws energy from it. And, uh, and you know, that's just, that's something that's just contagious for everybody. Oh, I like the way you said that, draws energy from it too. Yeah. Because yeah. I think yeah. we feel the same way for yeah. us as it's, for you sure. know, Absolutely. We, we have to bring level of energy, but yeah, you definitely come out of it feeling energized and excited. Yeah. I got my credentials this weekend and I'm. I was like excited wearing them already. It's yeah. real. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was gonna wear mine here today. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> So I'm going to jump to kind of one of my favorite, and you're, it's, it's a famous story, you know, for you and, and uh -huh. the, um, how you had your first lunch meeting mm. with Warren Buffett and you know, your donation to the charity organization mm -hmm. that was raising mm -hmm. funds to have lunch with um, Warren Buffett. Because what, what I was thinking about when I was, I was thinking about that story is you were already, you had your own firm. Yeah. You were already yeah. running a super successful firm. So when you went into that meeting, it ended up being life-changing. It was life changing for your career, you know, and life changing for, I mean, for, plan on that, for you. Yeah. Well, and that was my question. I thought, was this like your goal? Or were yeah. you going into it thinking, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this happen? Or yeah. did it end up going a whole different direction than you thought? Or Oh like, boy, yeah. It's kind of an involved thing because first, um, you know, I went to school uh, in Philadelphia college and in nineteen seventy nine when I started, there was a, a good friend of mine who um uh we were both in the business school there, and he said, you know, if you're really interested in business, there's this guy, Warren Buffett, who you just should read anything that he writes. I had never heard of Warren Buffett in 1979, but I respected this guy. And, uh, and I started reading this stuff, and I was like, wow, there's tremendous clarity to what he says, and it makes sense. And between taking, you know, the corporate finance uh, classes and accounting and all that, you had this that was kind of practical applied experience. So here's a guy who really was a hero of mine from, you know, an investing standpoint. From back when you were in college. Yeah, so from 1979. Yeah. So I'm reading all this stuff. And then I experienced, you know, some uh, decent success in investing and my fund uh, had had a, a, a good track record. And I knew that uh, Warren did this this auction, um, and it ben benefits uh, Glide Foundation in San Francisco. Wonderful charity. Sure. And I... I uh, happened to uh, uh, be a, a, a chair of a, a trust that met, met twice a year, once in San Francisco and once in Shanghai every year. And it was, gave me a good reason to kind of travel the world and got to know some folks. But I wanted to understand more about Glide before I did anything that you know, was a big ticket that I was going to write if I was going to do something like this. 
And so I was out at a trust meeting, uh, and uh, my assistant had reminded me that I wanted to visit the people at Glide and understand the thing. And she set the thing up. I finished my trust work. I spent half a day with the folks at Glide, and it just happened to be the last day of the auction that year. So it was going on while I was there. And I went down to, they invited me down to the uh, closing thing. They didn't know I was registered to bid on it. And, um, you know, I actually ended up winning the thing. And it was like, wow, <laughs> you know, this is, this is something. And, um, and it, it really, you know, after I had spent half a day with uh, uh, the folks at Clyde, I mean, just, a, again, great, great operation there. So that, that, was, that was terrific. What is the organization? What's that? Glide it, organization? Yeah, they... Glide. They, uh, they, they give hope to the other otherwise hopeless. I mean, they, it's a wonderful organization, hundreds of volunteers that run both a soup kitchen and a, um, uh, you know, a healthcare clinic uh, in the toughest part of San Francisco. And it's, you know, known to everybody in the city, very efficiently run and, uh, you know, touches a lot of lives. And uh, Warren's uh, 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 wife, Susie, had been very active in the thing. And so that was where the, the interest came okay. from. Yeah. Um, but I ended up winning this thing and, and I wasn't sure, you know, how what was going to happen. Um, but I, I'm back at my office and I get this phone call on a Tuesday morning and I pick up my phone and it's it's Warren on the other end. And it's like, oh, geez, this is this is something. You know, this is a zero. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, it was it, in he uh, it was terrific. And uh, I I had said the one thing that I wanted, I, I had wanted it to be anonymous and I want my name attached to it. And uh, I also wanted to do it in Omaha instead of New York. It was set up to be a New York uh, lunch at uh, Smith & Walensky's, a, gr a great steakhouse in New York. So very public. And yeah, and, and he, he said, that, that's fine. And uh, and then he said, well, when, when would you like to do it? And I said, well, you know, your schedule will dictate, you know, Mr. Buffett. And, uh, <laughs> and, he, said, and he, he really was unbelievable because then he says, well, I could do tomorrow night, I could do Wednesday, I could do Thursday, and he rattles on four days in a row. And I'm like, ah. And I, I think it was, I picked the day yeah, two days later. And so I, I flew out to Omaha, and uh, I, I met him uh, in his office, and, and it clicked. I mean, it really clicked. And it was kind of interesting, because I think there's a bookends to my career. My first job at WR Grace I was an analyst, and then I happened to have a job as the uh, the aide to the CEO there, who was a guy by the name of Peter Grace. And I, I, he and I, Peter and I had a great relationship, but I viewed him more as a almost a monarch than a CEO. Um, and he had all the trappings of being the the you know. Uh, high and mighty CEO of a Fortune 50 company. And he had to go through six doors to get to his office, and you know everything was maximum <laughs> wow. intimidation and all the rest of that. I see and, 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 and then you know Warren's just like I show up at headquarters, and he bounces out in the hallway and says, "You know, great to meet you, Ted. Come on in. You know, grab a seat on the couch," and you know immediately put me at ease. And it was just you know great. We we visited at the office for. Yeah, maybe uh, 45 minutes, an hour. Uh, there were a number of connections. He'd actually met Peter Grace a couple of times, so we had some Peter Grace stories that we connected over. And then we ended up having like a, a three-hour dinner at Piccolo's, uh, and, and, uh, and it really, really clicked. Then I, I actually bid on it the following year and, and won it again for <laughs> one dollar more. And, uh, and this time I I had a little bit more time to think about questions. and mm -hmm. How did you do like, that by yeah. the first time? Because you only have a few days. You didn't yeah. expect to win. Yeah. How do you plan questions for Warren Buffett? <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. You know, I, 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 my mind was kind of racing. and But, again, he, he's got this wonderful way of putting you at ease. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was just conversational. And, and I had a lot of questions about, you know, investing and, you know, uh, lessons learned and, you know, uh, uh, philanthropic uh, uh, dispositions, that kind of thing. And I, there's a lot of natural topics that came out. I wish I would have had more time to buff and polish, but that's okay. Right. You know, and, but <laughs> lo and behold, yeah. yeah, but another year later, you know, and, I, and I've got it again. And then that one I did have a few weeks to think about. And I put together a legal pad of, you know, dozens and dozens of things that I wanted to hit on. And we did the, the same deal. We went to Piccolo's, and um, and it was it was terrific. And I, but I had probably three pages of, of questions, and at, at toward the end of the the uh, the dinner, I uh, 
I just, geez, I think I've hit everything just naturally off of my checklist, but I just want to look at my notes. Do you mind? And, and you can ask me anything if you, if you want, Warren. And uh, he, uh, uh, as I'm looking down at my notes, checking stuff off, he says, you know, I, I, think, I think you'd be a pretty good fit out here. Do you, you have any interest in, in working at, at Berkshire? I just I absolutely panicked. You know, this was like, <laughs> this, was is, this, this, was, this was absolutely not what so I didn't was thinking. The first year. Oh, no, no, not, not at all. <laughs> not at all. And, and, I, um, uh, and, and my immediate reaction was, there's no way this works. You know, I got this good gig back in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm running a $2 billion fund. Right. It's just, you know, me and two other people. And, um, uh, but you can't just dismiss it. I mean, this is your, mm-hmm. your hero. And so I was like, wow, that's not what I expected, but, but thank you. And I, I got to think about that. So he drives me to the airport. Uh, right after dinner and drops me off and he gets out. We both get out and he says, you know, that thing I, I mentioned at, at dinner. Um, In case you've forgotten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, he said, he said Man, you don't have to decide now. But, I mean, if you feel it in like two, three, five years, you know, just let me know. And I'm like, wow. You know, at the time he was, he had just turned 80. And I'm like, that's really something to have uh, – that and I, I, uh, I really was still like, there's no way. This just does not make sense. And I, uh, I, I got back to Charlottesville and I gave a lot of thought to it. And and I sent him a note that basically said, it just doesn't work because my kids at the time were in grade school and my, um, uh, and you know my family they were had roots in Charlottesville. Mm-hmm. And I was I was running a a large bankruptcy actually for W R Grace. I it was it was one of my investments in in Peninsula. And it was a, a bankruptcy that I worked on for ten years. And uh, it, it, and so I said, I, I really need to see this through. There's probably another three years. And so I sent him a carefully worded letter, sent it off. And you know, within an hour, I've got this response from him. That's a, you know, email letter on his letterhead that says, you know, thanks for the note. Um, uh, and it was something to the effect of, you know, you can manage money from the moon as far as I'm concerned, so you can stay in Charlottesville. <laughs> and I like the fact that you want to finish up this bankruptcy. You can do that, you know, on, on our watch. You know, that's, that's not a problem. It's like, oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh. And, and then yeah, I started thinking more and more, and, um, you know, and he, a day later he sent me, a, you know, a, a proposal that kind of laid out how the mechanics would work and all the rest. And, and then I thought, you know, I'd been doing this, this fund at Peninsula for uh, 12 years. And once in a while, you just want to scrape the plate clean and, and do something new. And, uh, and so I, I decided, yeah, that, that'll work. And I, the only thing I asked was that, you know, I, I wanted to commit that I would come out to Omaha two days a week and, you know, be part of the team in Omaha. So I'd commute from Charlottesville, but Charlottesville would still meet my team, my, my home. And it's worked out beautifully. So I've been doing that for you know, a little over 10 years now. Wow. So you still, you come out two days a week? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, two, three sometimes. Yeah. Place here. Yeah. I've got a, a condo in Midtown Crossings that's fully outfitted by NFL. NFL. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Every piece is beautiful. It was perfect. <laughs> Did you agonize agonize over what to wear going into this? Uh, like I, I, I did, I did, yeah, yeah, no, and that's one of those. Um, it's funny, I, I, I absolutely did, and then I <laughs> and then I, I decided that I should go in. I remember that well. I decided I should go in with a suit coat and open shirt, mm-hmm. and of course he's wearing a tie. And that was that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I fumbled it right out of the yeah. right out of the block, but it, it's okay. <laughs> Obviously worked out. Yeah. 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 Uh, was it dessert at Dairy Queen afterwards, or was that, was that not? We, we we had the uh, root beer floats. Oh, okay. Yeah, which was uh, terrific. Yeah. yeah both times. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, both times. <laughs> So how fast was that in between, like the second meeting? Because it sounds like it was it moved pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean it was it was no more than three weeks after that second dinner wow. that I I said yeah, and then I uh, had to send a letter to all my investors that you know I was going to shut down shop and and send them their capital back and and uh, yeah, that came together came together very quickly. Yeah. So can we jump back a little? Then? Oh yeah, okay. we can so go anywhere you want. We're gonna we're gonna kind of flip back to mm. uh, your. First job. So you're yeah. coming right out of school and you were a junior financial analyst. Yeah, yeah. That's indeed what my title was. <laughs> <laughs> but what kind of caught my eye on that is that, I mean, you're, you're starting entry level yeah. into the company. And then like within seven years, you're 
leaving with the vice chair to start a company. And, you know, when you talk to people that's about... Good, that's good research. That's good. <laughs> you talk about career path. I mean, yeah. to, to give, to have that sort of visibility and trajectory to your career and yeah. that quickly, I'm just kind of fascinated by what, what do you look back and say, how did, how did you, how did you prove oh, yourself boy. that quickly? How yeah. did you... It, uh, what would you recommend to people? Yeah, lucky, lucky, lucky. I mean, it was just it, it, life's so funny in that stuff because I, I joke about the junior financial analyst, but that was a big deal because I was hired in as a test case into this department that did mergers and acquisitions at WR Grace, and uh, and I was the first undergraduate that they hired. It was otherwise just MBAs, and they were all wow. called financial analysts. And so I had the business card that said junior, junior. financial <laughs> analyst, <laughs> and not the graduate degree yeah, yet. Yeah, and then yeah. yeah, and so it was, and that's fine. But you know, it was a uh, it was a good gig at, that. Uh, you know, I, I didn't make much money, but if you stayed until eight o'clock working, you got. Uh, free taxi home and free dinner, and and that that made a big difference. Yeah. So you know, I was there till you know at least eight every night, and it was fun. I, I liked I liked working a lot more than um, uh, than um, uh, studying, and and I, I through through really happenstance, I worked there for two years. Had never even seen Peter Grace, the CEO of the company, and um, uh, I got a phone call uh, two years into it. And I had been working on a transaction, a leverage buyout of a medical company, and I had been working on it for probably two months. And I get this phone call, and it's uh, one of Mr. Grace's assistants saying that uh, Mr. Grace wants to be briefed on the national medical care acquisition, and boss boss is not in the building. Your <laughs> boss boss isn't in the building, <laughs> and your boss isn't in the building. <laughs> And, one and I'm like, oh, no, what does that mean? <laughs> and, and he said, we'd like you to come up to the 48th floor, to the top floor, and, and brief Mr. Grace on this project. And I'm like, no, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I'm 23. I look like I'm 12. I, you know, this, is not, this is not what I signed up for. And I go up there. I had no choice. And they, um, again, I get ushered through door after door after door and then into this conference room that's just enormous horseshoe that could sit uh, probably 55, 60 people. Oh, wow. And, and you know, there's a dozen other people there, and I get, you know, ushered into the center of the horseshoe. All and like senior leaders. Senior yeah. leaders, yeah. all the top people at the company. And then, you know, once we're all seated, this door opens and, you know, his holiness the comes through. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Peter comes through. And he, he, always, he always smoked a pipe. And he looks down and he looks at me and he says, who are you? Ben, I'm, I'm Ted Wessler. I'm here to brief you on national medical care. And you could see him getting a little bit agitated. He had never met me. He didn't know anything about this. And he, um, he, he said, so where do you, you go to school? I said, I went to University of Pennsylvania, uh, the uh, Wharton undergraduate. He said, you don't have an MBA? And he says, in a really biting way. And I'm like, oh, this is not started <laughs> out well. I'm the junior, and, though. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> oh. And, uh, and, and he, he, his pipe starts to shake a little bit. And, and he really was working up, getting quite worked up. And, and, uh, and he starts going off about, it's the biggest acquisition we've ever done. My grandfather founded this company. You're sending this kid up to brief me on this thing. And then he starts going down the line, you know, Chuck, where did you go to graduate school? You know, Yale, Peter, you know, and then it's like, I'm just, I'm going to join the Peace Corps. This is just, <laughs> just, just horrible. Absolutely horrible. And, and then actually it was this guy, Chuck, who was the vice chairman. He said, you know, Peter, just let the young man at least answer some of your questions. And, you know, Peter listened to him, Peter, Mr. Grace. And he starts asking me questions. And, yeah, I've been doing 100-hour weeks on this deal. And I knew the deal well. And, um, and it ended up being like an hour and a half meeting. And, you know, it was painful to start. But once it got rolling, it, I felt like it you did okay. Mm -hmm. I felt like it did okay. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, and then at the end of it, uh, Mr. Grace looks over and he says, you know, there's two people in this room that don't have an MBA, you and me. Oh, and and oh, it's like, wow. hmm, huh? <laughs> I still felt like hell, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. that's awesome. And then, no. then literally the next day, I got a, a phone call saying that uh, uh, Peter always had three assistants that traveled the world with him, either as advanced people or you know uh, financial types to do analysis while we were traveling. And he, and she said uh, he let one of his assistants go this morning, and he'd like you to join him in Boston tonight. Um, and pack for three weeks. So it was like, 
uh, you know, let me talk to my boss. And I said, no, you don't have to talk to your boss. Just be, <laughs> in, your be, boss. In, be, yeah. in, be, yeah. be in Boston. And so in you know, the next two years, I, I uh, was a traveling aide to Mr. Grace, which was really fascinating. Wow. And, and, you know, it was just to, and he was one of these guys, you really couldn't say much when you were in the room with him in business meetings, but you were the proverbial fly on the wall. He, he let you sit in on anything. Mm -hmm. And so you could learn yeah, that by was listening. Really, really powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and just very interesting. And his, his management style was a little bit different, but it was, it was, it was interesting and, and, uh, and a ton of fun. And, you know, and I did a, you know, I, I guess I did a decent job on that. Um, and then, uh, in 1987 came along and there was this crash, um, uh, in October. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I actually had, um, at that point, just before the crash, I had accepted a job with a, um, an arbitrage shop, uh, that did, uh, uh, investment in, in takeovers. And Mr. Grace was very upset that I was leaving, but he till the crash happened, and then he he called me and he said, um, "You know, you're you're basically an idiot." He, he used much rougher language than that <laughs> um, for for leaving. And you know, we, there's got to be some way that you know you'd like to stick around here. So he starts you know sending in these senior folks with different ideas for me and what have you. And uh, I ended up becoming the aide to the next heir apparent to Peter. And Peter was at that time maybe maybe seventy five. And this was probably heir apparent number four or five. Um, you know, there, there had been several people who looked like they might take mm -hmm. over for him. And, and so I did that because it was a guy that I, I uh, had a great relationship with and I, I worked with and, and uh, we'd done some leverage buyouts. And, uh, and that was another great experience. Um, but that's the gentleman that I started uh, the private equity firm with. Uh, and he and I set up a completely new company uh okay. and he uh, and i was i was going to leave grace and and start a money management firm he wasn't sure what he was going to do and you know over a, over a dinner we hatched this idea of setting up our own private equity firm and he was a he was a gray-haired guy with gravitas and i was the maniac in the back room who could, <laughs> you know, knew the tax code and knew how to use a computer and and, and it worked and that that firm still uh it, very successful in Charlottesville. It's got you know thirty professionals, manages several billion dollars, and 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 that that was a good thing. Um, and but then I, I wanted to set set up truly my own shop, and that's right. what took me to uh, setting up uh, my hedge fund. So there was the bit of luck with getting the exposure, but then your preparation and mm -hmm. yeah, I'd be curious your bit. reputation in the company because I think that would be interesting watching someone take that move. Mm. It was an odd time. And I, and I wasn't, you know, big corporations tend to be very political. And mm -hmm. I, um, I wasn't political because I didn't know anything about, you know, mm -hmm. corporate life. I didn't know that it wasn't right to CC this person or CC that person. And I think uh, I got a lot of buys because of that. You know, people, you know, didn't view me as some kind of clever villain. You were maneuvering. I was just, yeah, 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 yeah. I was just sort of like, I'm here to do a job. I want to, you know, make this company better if I can. And, uh, and it, 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 it worked out. Yeah. That's a good story. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. So then I'm going to kind of skip, you, you sort of started talking about this, but um, you were at Quad C. It mm -hmm. still exists to this day. Yeah. Um, you were there 10 years, yep. built it. Uh, what what was the impetus for doing your own thing? Was that all, yeah. was that always the ultimate goal? No, it was, or? It's, it's, it's interesting uh, because when we first set up Quad C, uh, it was this amalgamation of um, uh, my partner's idea that he we wanted to have control investments where we actually bought companies, and my preference was I wanted to do investing in publicly traded securities. And are those and, two typically different worlds? Yeah, yeah. Okay. and one is you know buying things listed on the stock exchange and just where in effect you own, you know, a small percentage of the business, whereas the other stuff that that he was good at was actually owning the businesses and making the operational decisions, and um, so we created this hybrid where we said, okay, we're going to set up a vehicle where we'll ask um, uh, 
folks that we know that have some money to put money in, and uh, I would invest it in public securities um, uh, while we were looking for control investments. So, and I kind of wore both hats. Where, I, and when you're studying, you know, if somebody shows you a business that's in, you know, furniture manufacturing. First thing you're going to do is look at everybody in furniture manufacturing and how they're valued in the marketplace. And, and once in a while, you'll see something and say, boy, this just doesn't make sense. This is really cheap. You know, there might be an opportunity to invest a little bit in this publicly traded company, and maybe we'll do the acquisition as well or not. And, um, uh, and, and that was that was fun. I, I I liked that, and and we did that. For he the, likes to find, like find yeah, and it was because he, I could I could look at it from both uh, both angles, and 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 it, it there's a pretty high bar for doing something in the public security. So it wasn't like a, it was a trader. It was like, is there something really compelling? And there's a, there's a great quote of Warren's about you know we'd all be better investors if we had a punch card that every time we made an investment we had a click it and that punch card had only 20 punches available to you you know so you really had to have this high bar to make an investment well lo and behold in the six years that we did this i made exactly 20 exactly it's just really <laughs> weird how that worked out but uh in 19 of the 20 worked out really well and i had a nice track record because of that but uh we had reached this at the six-year mark at quad c we reached this point where we wanted to raise money not just from individuals but from institutions so like you know the harvard endowment and brown university and what have you and uh, they're wonderful investors but they tend to have uh, checklists that they want to see and and they want you to be you know exactly this slot or that slot they don't want you to be a hybrid that does both control investments and you know, little things off to the side. And, uh, you know, and I, I worked on setting up the private placement memorandum and working with the investment bank on how to put this thing together. And, and I concluded that, boy, I've got this nice track record, but, you know, it's not going to fit in this institutional model. So I said, okay, fine, we'll just take that out and we'll raise this institutional fund, which we did. And it was a, a successful raise. We got a ton of money. But then I realized, it wasn't exactly what I loved, um, and the firm had grown a bit. I was doing more people management than investing in businesses, and and I mean the thing that I, I I'm an analyst. I mean I still want to have a business card. I wanted to say analyst, not junior <laughs> financial, but analyst. <laughs> and and it's it, you know and I was getting away from that. And, you know, and, and how many employment agreements can you negotiate? I mean that's what it came down to. It's like the learning curve had just flattened out and and uh and 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 i saw a window of opportunity that if i could take the private equity mindset where you're buying the business and you expect to own it for five to ten years and do that with publicly traded securities where i'd buy you know three or four percent of a business but i'd have a very long-term view I thought that might be something that would work and would be appealing to uh, some investors. Is and, that a little bit different yeah. in the model because the turnover is typically quicker? Yeah. Okay. It, it, you know, the average holding period for a, a share of stock on the New York Stock Exchange is less than a year. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's just people, so there's a market. far more people that are trading than are actually buying a piece of the business and holding it for the long term. And and I wanted to do it in a way that I I, I wasn't uh I wasn't in any way, you know, hostile or, you know, negative toward management, but if you're in something with a 5 to 10 year view, you've got a better chance to build a relationship with the management team and have credibility. And and so there were several of these things. They were small companies, but you know, they didn't necessarily necessarily have a great uh connection to Wall Street or to capital markets, and not that I necessarily did, but I at least knew, you know, the way around. And I would never go in and say, you know, I know this stuff better than you. I'd just say, here's some ideas and, you know, it may be helpful to you. And over time, um, I call it a, a mad investing, I mean, make a difference investing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can potentially change the outcome by being actively involved in some part of the process. And that's where this WR Grace bankruptcy came along, where it's like, wow, I know this company well. It was in bankruptcy because it had over 100,000 uh, lawsuits against it relating to asbestos exposure um, of, of some of their products. And uh, I, I, I'd done a lot of work in bankruptcy for whatever reason, and it just thought, I thought it was something that 
I might be able to make a difference there by getting involved. And I bought about 15% of the business. And, and again, it took 13 years, but it ended up, ended up being a very successful restructuring that I was involved in. Um, but the short answer to your question is I wanted to get back into just investing in, in public securities because that's, that's something in private equity where you're looking at control investments. You're relying on investment bankers coming to you and giving you a book, and that book's you know 120 pages of all this wonderful stuff about these businesses. But you open it up on the first page, it says you know book number 132 or something, and yeah, so it's like they're sending everything, and Mm -hmm. and then you end up feeling you know bad if you don't at least bid on it because guess what? They stop sending you books, and you got to keep the books coming in if you're going to do it. But but on public securities, you know, if you don't buy something, you know, guess what? The Wall Street Journal still shows up at your doorstep every day, or your computer, as the case may be. You know, you don't you don't have that, in effect, moral obligation to move on anything. You can just uh, you know wait for the right opportunity to come along. And that that was always appealing to me. All right, I have to ask you this. Yeah, you got nineteen out of twenty. What was the one you missed? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too yeah, curious. Not yeah, to ask. it was. Uh, uh, yeah, I know my, you know my, it. I do. I guess. <laughs> It's funny because it, it went by the name of T.W. Holdings at the time, and my initials are T.W. So it's like, you know, just, of Why course, I should have, should right? have stayed yeah. away from there. You know. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a big restaurant uh, uh, operator. It, at the time, it uh, owned Denny's and a several, several, oh. several other okay. things. It was, and I, you know, sometimes things don't work out, mm-hmm. but it did not work out. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be something you thought in your original assumption. Yeah. You know you oh, no, it was. It was <laughs> yeah. the initials. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vanity took me. <laughs> so one thing I saw a a interview of Warren Buffett, and he said that you are one of the few people he's met that reads as much as he does. Oh, I and didn't then, see that. <laughs> yeah, and um, I read something else where you said that your job really is reading. Yeah. Um, and would just love to hear kind of what you read and how that kind of informs. Because, you know, yeah. a lot of times you think people are all reading the same thing, right? You're reading yeah. the trade journals. Oh, and yeah. oh. and is, it, is your success more about that you're able to interpret it or yeah. that you're reading more so you're pulling yeah. more information? But just No, you, you hit on it. And it's, it's a great question. The way you ask it is just right. Because... Um, I think one of the great mistakes of investing is that people do end up reading the same st- thing, same thing. And you know, you really you're, the only way you're going to have success in the in the stock market is if you've got what's referred to as a, a variant perception, something mm-hmm. that's different from the masses. Because if, if you know, everybody says, "Wow, this you know, Facebook is hot," well, everybody jumps in. You know, do you really have and that? I'm speaking ten years ago, mm-hmm. not not right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so. You know, I one of the things that I and I, you know Warren and I have this in common. We both love newspapers, and um, I really enjoy newspapers. And I grew up with them in the house. And you know, there's kind of always the uh, morning, almost a competition with my mother because she always read it before <laughs> I did. And it was like, who picked up more from the newspaper? You know, it's like, and and, and it, all in good fun, um, but. It, it's one of those habits that you get into. And what's really great about newspapers, though, is there's a, a randomness about them. Just by definition, there's you know, different sections to it. And uh, you know, I read uh, a bunch of different ones. But it, it, it's a random set of stories that come together because an editor says, geez, this might be interesting or what have you, or it is top of mind. It's very interesting to see how a given political story is portrayed in mm-hmm. Uh, USA Today versus the New York Times, mm-hmm. you know, what will be bu- front page above the fold in the New York Times, you know, maybe on page three of USA Today. Um, much deeper reporting in the New York Times, but y- y- you really want to understand where it's positioned. And then, you know, how's the Financial Times in London going to play the thing, you know, and, you know, so you, because you do need to keep all the different perspectives, uh, take them into account. Uh, but but it is random. And, uh, you know, if I can come up with one decent investment idea a year, boy, that is great. Um, and and it, it is a game of, I call it a game of connect the dots where, you know, you want to build up a terrific data set and maybe you'll be able to say, ooh, I read this here, I read this here, I read this here, and make a connection such that you've got a little bit different perception of where a business is going to be five years from now than where the market 
does. And, you know, a game I always like to play is, you know, do a work on a company and say, without knowing where it's, what, what the price is in the stock market, you know, mm -hmm. study and say, this is where I think it'll be. And then you like, you oh, do the uncovering, you say, oh, I think this should trade at $82 a share. And it's like, Ooh, it's at 40. Ooh, this is interesting. Yeah. Usually means I missed something really <laughs> bad, <laughs> but, but it is, it's, you know, that was, it's, you know, I, I, it's always been a game that I've played and it's, and it keeps, and it keeps it interesting. interesting. But then trade journals, you know, they're really powerful. And, and there's a lot of investors that, that don't, uh, uh, subscribe to those. And I, you know, we actually, uh, Furniture Today, I've been a Furniture Today subscriber for the last, geez, over 30 years now. And I, it's interesting because it is one of those things that, you know, it's a, it's a 10 minute read once a week. Um, but if you read it with regularity, you do see, you know, the different names and how they're evolving and, you know, who's doing what. And that's, you know, where I got to know a Nebraska furniture market yeah. was uh, I actually didn't even make that the connection with uh, with Berkshire, but I used to always read about that. And I've been involved with furniture in a bunch of different ways over the years. Um, but but I, I always do want to be able to look myself in the mirror and say that I'm reading enough weird stuff that nobody else is reading the same stuff that I am. And, and if you're just reading the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, there's no way you're going to beat other you're people. Just like you're just reading. Else. You're just reading yeah. the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's other just peripheral stuff. That yeah, and so like yeah, I, I, I read, uh, yeah, Furniture Today and Uranium Weekly. I'm not sure there's a lot of people that subscribe to both right. of those. Yeah. <laughs> you're looking at one of them. <laughs> well, and the the investments you do at Berkshire are different than what you were doing, or, or maybe I should I, mean, I should yeah. ask that. Uh, this, I, well, yes and no. Um, they're different in that it's just a, a much bigger pool of capital, um, and that and that's a, a not insignificant factor uh, because we do have a very large pool of capital. And uh, you know, when I was running Peninsula, you know, at its largest, it was two billion dollars, and uh, I typically would have that invested in ten different ideas, which would be about two hundred million dollars per idea. And uh, there's, you know, thousands of companies out there that would let you deploy $200 million in them that are big enough to do that. But when you get up into the Berkshire size, um, I, I essentially need ideas that I can deploy at least a billion dollars into. Which narrows. Narrows mm -hmm. it because I generally, except in exceptional cases, I generally don't want to own more than 10% of a business, because once you go over 10%, you have additional filing requirements with the SEC. In effect, every trade you do, you need to publicly declare within 72 hours of making the trade. And that's just, it's a hassle. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you, you work into the math, and if you've got to put a billion dollars to work and you don't want to be more than 10%, it means you've got to only invest in companies that have at least a $10 billion market capitalization. So that cuts out a big chunk of the market. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, my primary job is looking for ideas like that, public securities. But I also work on acquisitions, uh, you know, so if deals come along that might be interesting to buy 100% of, similar to what I did in my Quad C days or at mm -hmm. WR Grace, uh, you know, it's something I'm, I'm very comfortable with. I've, I've been doing those kind of uh, analysis for, for a lot of years. And again, I'm just, I'm just here to help out wherever I can. <laughs> yeah. Any books you, you have read recently that you'd say oh, recommend highly? Wow. Um, yeah. Let's think about that. Um, I'm, I must say, I, the vast majority of stuff I read are, are the periodicals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just that's uh, um, the um, I'm, I'm in the a middle one that's that is is quite good. It's uh, called Trillion Dollar Triage. That is the I've not heard of that uh, detailing the um, uh, in effect the bailout of the system from COVID in um, March of uh, wow. 2020, and uh, it's it's a gripping read uh, mm -hmm. because it really goes through you know, how quickly COVID became a global issue and the ramifications for the global economy and the U.S. economy and how interdependent the U.S. economy is with the rest of the world and what, you know, very brave people like Jay Powell had to do on a moment's notice to make sure, you know, the wheels didn't fly off the train. And it's, it's, it is, uh, it's quite the read, quite the read. How did COVID affect your day-to-day -day Berkshire Hathaways, you know, from investment and um, 
strategy. Yeah. Well, there's the kind of the humanistic side where all of a sudden everybody's yeah. like at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think Warren and I had in common, we were like, this this was not going to work. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I, 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 I like sitting at my desk. It's space that I'm comfortable with, mm -hmm. whether it's Charlottesville or Omaha. I think Warren worked out of his house for maybe a week or two and mm -hmm. was like, yeah, this ain't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and so we... Uh, uh, there's there's only 26 people at headquarters, and uh, most of the folks went remote. Uh, we went, uh, you know, very careful with the masking, um, and you know, I started every. I, I did come out pretty much every week, though, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I did, took a test every came, time I came out. I didn't want to be the one who's bringing bringing a nasty bug from uh, Virginia <laughs> uh -huh. to, uh, to to Omaha. Uh, so that that was a big impact. Yeah. Um, but then you know it it. I, it was a tough one from an investing standpoint because, uh, you know, all of us, I mean, it's, it's Warren, uh, Todd Combs is the other investment manager. Uh, you know, we looked at each other and it's like, wow, just have not seen anything like this. You know, not yeah. sure how this is going to play out. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of very good information, um, but we didn't have a relative edge. Mm -hmm. um, Did you have to have those conversations just like what you just said there? Like, how is this going to even Oh, play yeah. Out? No, just, it was, you know, we're sitting there over, you know, quarter pounders with cheese saying like, <laughs> yeah, what, 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 what do we think? And yeah. then it was like, geez, you know, I just, just don't know. Um, and in the, the, you know, it was, it was brilliant work on the part of the Fed and Jay Powell in, you know, fixing everything. Um, but the moment they came in, I think it was March 20th of 2020, that they, the Fed effectively put a floor under everything. And the moment they did that, the opportunities that would have been there for Berkshire, they weren't there anymore. I mean, what, what does that mean? Well, it means floor? that, you know, historically the best times for Berkshire have been when there's been difficulties out there, where people uh, needed capital uh, and banks weren't lending because mm -hmm. there was a banking crisis going on. And so we'd say, wow, we like your business. You know, we'll effectively lend you money or we'll buy 15 percent of your business in a, in a negotiated transaction. Uh, good for you. Good for us. Um, and, you know, in uh, 2000, we did several of those, uh, you know, Warren did several of those kind of trades that were very, very good. You know, they, they built on Berkshire's reputation. They helped the companies involved. Um, we've done one with General Electric, one with Harley Davidson Motorcycles, one with Tiffany's. I mean, mm -hmm. they're just a, a bunch of these, but they all were very good transactions, you know, relatively low risk. Um, and we thought like, oh, you know, maybe this is, we can do this this time around. Mm -hmm. But uh, the window closed very quickly. Uh, okay. And with all of a sudden, I, the view was, the banking system was going to effectively shut down and there wasn't going to be lending available for institutions. But in actual fact, uh, there was plenty of money available. The Fed came in and said, you know, open the, open the vault, mm -hmm. whatever you need. Um, mm -hmm. And then even Which Berkshire can't compete door? with that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then so how has that kind of transitioned um, versus where we are now? Yeah. Well, then, then you get to kind of watch the uh, cards play out. And it, it really was quite interesting because, you know, one of the indirect uh, beneficiaries was uh, NFM, you know, that uh, the nesting phenomenon that all of a sudden people yeah. are spending a lot more time at their house and and uh, they're like, wow. That, Didn't that, like their sofa. Yeah, they it's like, not time, all time for a new <laughs> one. Time for a new one. And, yep. and, uh, and it's played out very differently in, in the different businesses, mm -hmm. but on balance, it's actually played out very, very well. And um, and we've got you know just a great mix of of operating businesses that make up Berkshire, mm -hmm. and uh, you know there it was rocky for that you know March April, but all of a sudden then it was like wow yeah this is this this could work out, mm -hmm. and uh, people got into the cadence of uh, you know a, a different way of doing business and. And but it's been it really has been all good. And, and we found some some ideas in the public marketplace. Um, uh, this last go round, um, you know, the tragedy of Russia, Ukraine, you know, that that really did rattle the markets. And that's the sort of thing that I think we we're in a better position to assess because there has been similar things that have happened in the last 125 years that you can say, you know, how does this play out and what are the probability adjusted, what sort of outcomes could you have? And um, and we've made some public announcements in the last uh, 
uh, 30 days of things that we're, we're investing in. So we've moved, moved some money uh, in, the last, in the last couple of months. What are you thinking a lot about right now? Oh, wow. <laughs> Besides uranium yeah. today. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Note to I feel weird, actually. I let that lapse now. I'm feeling bad. So I'm gonna, I got to re-up your subscription. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, the things I think a lot about, but I don't have any uh, influence over is, you know, uh, inflation. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. it's real. Uh, how long is it going to last? How does it impact different different businesses? Um, you know, the strength of the U.S. dollar or the weakness on any any given month. Uh, you know, China U.S. relations. These are all big picture things that are mm-hmm. going to impact the long term, um, and they 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 shape our thinking, but. They're all they're all background things, um, uh, but again, it's what's what's interesting about this business is you kind of have to have a little bit of background knowledge on all this stuff mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. have the right lens to look at investment opportunities. You're oh. feeling positive. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm feeling positive. I, I always <laughs> feel positive. I mean, I, 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 it's a system that works, and um, uh, there's always going to be some negativity out mm-hmm. there, um, but. You know, again, the world of investing, If you, as long as you take a long-term view, um, we've got the right incentives, particularly in the United States, of, you know, you, uh, entrepreneurs are, uh, you know, encouraged, um, new technologies develop, um, you know, we... new things and new uh, uh, and positive things uh happen every day, every every week, every year. And so, yeah, I, I can't help but be optimistic. No, I was just going to say, thinking about your your point earlier about reading and yeah. consuming all yeah. of this information, I imagine that's the best way to kind of stay informed yeah. on, on no, all of it that. Is. And, yeah, it's, it's uh, because it is, it's not just one specific thing. Mm-hmm. It is, this, you know, all these different flows of information. Yeah. And, and it's also where it's important to, to read. You know, a paper from Europe and a paper from Canada and, Mm -hmm. you know, a bunch of stuff in between because it does give you a little bit different perspective. Yeah, Yeah. certainly. And rather than being like, you know, overwhelmed by all of the information, just view it as a, as another opinion or perspective on it. So. And variant perception. Mm-hmm. There, there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's all coming together. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always like to come back and talk about home. Yeah. You know, to kind of yep. recenter on what we do. Uh, so a couple of questions for you about just home. You've moved a few times yep. and you've got your place here in Charlottesville. Yep. What what makes a house feel like home to you? What are, mm. are there key pieces or yeah. things you have to have? Oh, it's interesting. The um uh you know, growing up, I, my father was with um uh AMP food stores uh and we moved pretty much every 3 or 4 years from, you know, when I was you know, 0 4 8 12. So your parents had to build yeah. rebuild homes. Yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. and and you know, there's there's those pieces that I always moved house to house that you know def- define the house, and and I have a uh, uh, you know my uh, I don't know, do they still sell Naga Hide? The name Naga Hide does that ring a bell? Oh. So. <laughs> it's for me though. <laughs> Why? I, yeah, the name that sounds familiar, like, but it was it was one of the first faux leathers. Too young. Okay. And it was yeah. very very popular. <laughs> okay. Very like, popular in that the forties, fifties, and sixties. Okay. And, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Faux leather, like branded faux leather. Yeah, yeah. it was. Just like and it was called polyurethane. It, it was yeah. called it was uh-huh. called Naga Hide. And actually, in the sixties, they had a very successful. I thought it, I thought it was funny as a kid. But it was a uh, advertising campaign about how. Naga hide came from the Naga, which is this, you know, mythical <laughs> animal. And they said that it, the nice thing about the Naga <laughs> oh, yeah. is it shed its skin and they didn't have to. You know, I think, <laughs> we need to and, file oh, that away. Yeah, that yeah, is yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. 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 But it, it, basically, it's, it's vinyl on top yeah. of fabric. Uh-huh. And, it, and it cleaned up nice and was great in the house of kids. But got my, I call it my uh, my father's uh, Naga hide uh, Archie Bunker chair. And it's another, <laughs> you and still it, have it? Oh, absolutely. It's and it's still the same right. Naga hide and it's just as beautiful i mean this yeah. stuff will last forever and uh you know but that i mean it's i'm sure if an interior designer 
came in, they'd say, you got to get rid of that chair. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to yeah. get rid of that it's chair. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's yeah. my dad's chair. Yeah. And, uh, and But then there's, you know, there's just, uh, we, we always did get something new growing up, you know, each house that we went to. I think one of the things, it, and this is kind of interesting because I'm, I'm always kind of a student of inflation and products and what have you. And um, furniture has gotten relatively much less expensive over mm-hmm. the last 50 years. And, you know, the, the example I use is, um, you know, uh, the, the couch that my mom and dad bought in 1965 when I was four years old, you know, they would have spent like four weeks of the, you know, average earnings yeah, of a, yeah. a, and now that four weeks now is closer to one week. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a combination of, you know, much more efficient manufacturing and much more efficient distribution of something like NFM, which is really, you know, incredible because, you know, when we bought something, it was going to the neighborhood furniture store and, and, you know, it, it was nice. It was relationship driven, but boy, it was very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, um, you know, uh, and I think I've looked at these numbers recently in inflation for furniture since 1965, when I was four years old, about 2% a year for the last, uh, you know, whatever, uh, 50, 55 years. And overall inflation is about 4%. And and that over a long period of time, that's got huge implications. Mm -hmm. And, And it really is quite something that, you know, now you can get fresher stuff and, and funner stuff. And if you get tired of that sofa or what have you, I'm not going to get tired of the Naga Hut. <laughs> Maybe that'll come back big. Maybe it'll come back big. Um, but uh, but we, we always did make a point of getting something new. And and I still have a lot of fun items from from my house growing up. And I, I love my apartment here because it was, it was a chance to just start with a blank slate yeah. and mm-hmm. got, you know, a bunch of stuff. And if I was doing it again, there's probably some things that I want to buy. It's funny, you know, I bought a, a I, I, I outfitted this probably six years ago and uh, I bought two nice TVs that I don't think I've turned on in the last year. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, you know, what I want to watch, I watch on my iPad now. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, but you know, that's also what's fun about the world is it, it changes okay, so quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So which daughter is buying for the the, the chair? The Naga Hut. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. I, I don't think there's going to be any fighting. I think, I think that they might have to buy an extra large like funeral vault just to like <laughs> put, put that with me. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple of we're getting down to the end yeah. of time. So, a couple know. of final questions. Um, you're a runner. Yes, I that's, am. That's marathon runner. You missed not very many days. Did you run today? I did. Wow. I <laughs> wow. Wait, one one day. One day in the last forty whatever thirty eight years. What is it about yeah. about running and any lessons that go into your investing from that? Yeah, yeah. I, it's uh, yeah. It's it's a, it's a good question. It, uh, my mindset is very different when I'm running. And, and I think there's some clinical stuff on this. I mean, if you have increased blood flow, your brain works a little bit differently. And it, to the extent I hit something that's a, a difficult conceptual issue and I'm, I'm reading or analyzing something, I mentally like to like put it off to the side and say, like, I want to think about this again when I'm running. And it's, mm-hmm. and it's, and it's a great clear your head. And then there's time to just run and I don't think about anything. Mm-hmm. But the discipline aspect of doing it every day, it's a great way to wake up and kind of... You're a morning you know, runner. I, I used to be a, a night breeze. runner, and now, <laughs> yeah. now, now, I'm, yeah, now it's absolutely the first thing I do, yeah. and it help, mm-hmm. helps me wake up. But it's something that I really... Uh, I, I, I just feel, I've, never, I've never felt bad. I've never felt worse after a run. Um, you know, mm-hmm. So I can have the flu feel awful and like, how am I going to get out running? But I always feel better. Mm -hmm. I may still feel bad, but I always feel better after going Mm -hmm. for a run. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. And then final, what what excites you about the future? Uh, Investment, personal? Yeah. You know, it just, uh, the investing business is, is, I just find it so interesting. And if you're you're intellectually curious, um, and that's something kind of really a common element among Warren and and myself and Todd is uh, there's nothing better, you know, because if you get, uh, you know, if you're studying the banking industry in the morning and you say, geez, okay, I've had enough of this. Well, then you can uh, study the home furnishings business and then, you know, go back to uranium in the evening. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's just, uh, it's, 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 it's just fun. And, and the fact that things are uh, changing, you know, and they, you know, change is a constant. It's going to, always going to be new things out there. And so, you know, the, uh, the idea that 
you know, I didn't even know what streaming was 10 years ago. And now that's just kind of, you know, dominating the now delivery. you don't watch your TV. You yeah, that. right. Yeah. 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 And it and that's the sort of thing that uh, it, it just keeps it interesting. And and uh, and and then you overlay, you know, health care and, uh, you know, the, uh, this, you know, this, these vaccines that would come up with and the, the science that got done over the last 24 months. Just incredible. I mean, really exciting stuff. And, you know, to be fortunate enough to be on the earth while all these things are accelerating and all these new developments. Um, and, yeah, there's some issues. And, you know, this, again, the conflicts are, are, are terrible. But there's uh, it, it's on balance more than the swamp by the good stuff that's going on out there. Mm-hmm. I learned a ton. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we'd be happy to. Let's go for a couple more hours. <laughs> <laughs> we have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get to the yes no section of the <laughs> You have to come back and, and share more of these stories. It'd be a blast. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Um I want to thank everyone who's listening at home and encourage you to go to nfm.com to learn more about our company and shop 24-7 for today's top furnishing styles. We'll be back again soon with another episode. Till then, remember, home is what you make it. Thanks for listening to 